In Bhutan, in 1995, as a group of tourists hiked through the Misty Mountains. But this is not a pristine wilderness, nor a primitive trail as we come to find it is littered with decorations and structures. Even a convenient bridge. They cross, but almost immediately consider heading back down the mountain due to an ominous nor'easter bearing down on them. However, Paul hears a faint tooting sound from off in the distance, and it maxes out his curiosity meter. He seems to be the only one it calls to, and he floats off in wonder in its general direction, until he doesn't. Always quick to help a bro, Greg saddles up and descends into the welcoming folds of the crevasse. But when he gets down there, Paul is already super busy praying to the god of the mountain. Or goddess? Despite his concentration, Paul is decent enough to whisper to Greg that touching him will result in Greg's death. But with no clear danger nearby or context of what he's on about, Greg resolves to get his bud out of there even despite his passive resistance. Greg struggles to dig deep enough to find the stamina to fireman carry Paul all the way down, and right as his hammies really start squealing, they find a rustic cabin just off the trail. Inside, they work to get Paul's clothes off to check for unseen injuries and find an object in his hand. As the storm rolls in, they've gotten everyone all comfy, with no obvious signs of external distress other than some old wounds. So they settle in for some tea as he works out his issues and they attempt to calm Ruthie, insisting there's little they can do other than observe him overnight. That evening, while keeping a vigil, we learn that the item he held was responsible for the sound that summoned him from a distance, as Ruthie gives it a little blow. This snaps her into an alternate reality where all she can hear are footsteps outside her room, but she explores the cabin to find no one. The next morning, we see the rain has turned to snow. Greg and Fiona head out while Ruthie occupies her time by doing the homeowner's laundry, and then she sees a figure out in the snow. Hoping it's someone who can help, she runs out to see who it'd be, but soon realizes that it's obviously not here to help. It plays a little game of matching her step for step before chasing her full steam back into the cabin. However, the pounding at the door soon comes into resolution as we hear Greg and Fiona asking to be let in, and confirming they didn't see anyone outside with Ruthie. That night, as they all get some rest this time, we see Paul awake and filling Ruthie's subconscious with some sort of whispered filth. The next morning, they discover that Paul is not in bed anymore, and his jacket is missing. They follow the trail of his footprints and are relieved that he's just back at the bridge, meditating and tuning on his reed whistle, ascending to another plane of existence. He makes sure to let Greg know that he told him so real quick before Ruthie pulls out a knife and starts stabbing and slicing and pushing people into the abyss. As Paul sheds a single tear, she pencil dives right after them, ending their short vacation in Bhutan. Flash forward to Missouri in 2018. We find a man jogging, although we don't yet know if he is empty. This is James, and he runs a personal security business and seems to have some personal demons. On full demonstration as he enjoys a solitary wet lunch purchased with a birthday coupe, which unwittingly results in a celebratory treat. When he gets back to the old bachelor pad, he finds Amanda out back, wanting to check on him since it's the one-year anniversary of some alluded-to tragic event in which family members died. She's come to offer some comfort. Nothing can hurt you, because nothing is real. Ah, I see. Through her own personal research and growth, she's discovered the power of manifestation, tapping into a shared consciousness streaming through all history. James isn't so much of a woo-woo guy, and she's a dumb teenager, so she leaves him to mull it over a bit. Quick nightmare of his family asking where he was, and then he pops his morning dosage to start his day. James then gets a call to Amanda's home, where her mother, Nora, an old friend, reports that she's gone missing. But she was kind enough to leave a parting message. As the police go through their routine, we learn that James used to be an undercover cop, and as their questions turn toward the idea that Amanda may have left of her own volition, it becomes clear that they don't intend to do much to investigate the events that have transpired here. As an old friend, James offers to step in and act as an investigator, and he starts by acquiring a list of Amanda's school chums. In a very natural and unsuspicious manner, he heads down to the local schoolhouse and starts asking kids their names and if they'd like to get into his car. He finds Devara, who tells him about the empty man myth. You go to a bridge and find an empty bottle. Blow on that sucker while thinking of the empty man. And a few days later, he appears. Since she and Amanda happen to have recently found themselves at a bridge with their friend group, she recounts the tale. Through this, Amanda provides additional context to the friend group, which is us, teaching that if you successfully summon him, you hear him on the first night, can't stop thinking of him on the second, and then finally get to meet him on the third. To prove they ain't scared, they all participate in the ritual. But Amanda takes it a step further, taking up a relaxed position and really getting into an empty man mindset, repeating his name over and over and giving it the attention it truly deserves. It ends when the ambient noise cuts out and the teens hear some reciprocal blowing from the other end of the bridge, followed by pounding footsteps that cause them to scatter. 
As she concludes the story, we see Amanda engaging in some familiar whispering and observe indications the whole friend group is affected. James secures some additional addresses and begins beating some bushes, hoping to rattle some of these little shithead's cages. But everywhere he goes, he finds nothing but missing persons and sometimes bloody leavings. He heads out to the bridge to see if he can retrace their steps from the last time they were all together. While making observations, he foolishly turns off the sound save for a faint clanging noise. James follows it below deck where he finally finds some friends, the source of the clanging, and a familiar message. The police are there into the evening, cleaning up the bodies and collecting what evidence they can. And we see James also more seriously pondering some evidence he found, but is keeping to himself for now. As he rests up, we catch up with Devara, preparing to treat herself to a night's steam. She loves the feel of the heat enveloping her body and relishes in the toxins streaming from her pores. But she's not alone, and the empty man interrupts her simple pleasure to ravage her face. As we step back to see, it is she who is doing this violence to her own self. This news makes it back to James during his interrogation regarding his investigation, and they all consider the sheer will required to commit apparent suicide via multiple stab wounds to the face. The lead detective is concerned now about the poisonous nature of suffering this much darkness in such a small town. There have been multiple instances of unusual violence, all seemingly unrelated other than the message about the empty man. His plan? We can't ignite the cosmos. Pretend like it never happened and hope that it goes away on its own. James has his own obligations, however, and decides to hit the old keyboard to do some research. He learns the Pontifex Institute is considered a death cult, revolving around the concept of thought form, a colloquial word used for a psychic manifestation. Nora then comes over to make sure James has had something to eat and offers up some comfort. We learn quickly that they have a raw animal sensuality between them, which naturally leads to crossing some self-imposed boundaries, and so she heads back out. James sleeps, but doesn't get much rest and is soon awoken in the early morning hours to sounds coming from his front hall. As he watches the front window, the lights go out, and he observes clear evidence that there is a presence in the house. This is further confirmed when he finally works up the courage to confront the intruder and finds the front door is also open. The next day, James takes some time out of his busy schedule to learn about unleashing the power of the mind. After a simple application process, he follows the wackadoos into the grand ballroom, where Arthur Parsons gives a life-changing speech about how, like, we live in a society and nothing is real, man. Like, the sky is only blue because someone told you it was. There is only the great binding nothingness. And he confirms his words are directly sponsored by the Empty Man. Arthur gives James a bit of his time during the meet and greet afterward. He explains the Empty Man in a bit more detail, but James finds it a bit too enigmatic to pull apart. So he bids him adieu, but takes a detour on the way out, exploring the deep levels of the building and finding the barracks downstairs along with the extensive records room. He just keeps going, and it seems to just keep going, until he eventually stumbles upon a master class of mantra chanters. After making a noise, he is, we presume, asked to reveal himself. But he soon learns that they're not talking to him as a strange shuffling noise emanates from below. He attempts to peek over the railing, but his revelation is interrupted by security who escort him outside. In the dank gutter, he meets an insider who seems to want to share information with him. What he gets is a warning about the group's power and the location of their secret camp where things tend to get really strange. James drives out and lets himself into the information center, where he starts sifting through their records and finds the gang's all here, with quite a bit of personal information going back pretty far. Just for further confirmation of the crazy, he checks out one of the cabins and finds a VHS tape in which the cabin occupants recorded themselves performing some unusual rituals that resulted in some strange manifestations. When James emerges, he sees a light off in the distance and goes toward it. He witnesses a group of freaks enjoying a jog around the bonfire. Their chanting and energy really invigorates the flame and results in James having a brief vision. But he soon snaps out of it to find the flame gone, and then the light is similarly extinguished. The group moves in unison in his general direction, following him step for step before taking off in a full-out sprint as he retreats into the woods. He manages to make it to his vehicle and tear out of there into the night, wondering, What the fuck was that? A good question. He immediately runs to the station to drop off the files and is encouraged to write a statement, but also seems to notice the guys are side-eyeing him pretty hard. So afterward, he gears up at his shop and rushes to Nora's house. He recommends she head out for a few days, filling her in on the dangers of the Pontifex Institute before dropping her off at a hotel. Through their parting words, we get confirmation that his recurring nightmare is of his family dying in a car wreck, which happened at the same time he was stepping out with Nora. He wakes up at 3 a.m. again and now gets to meet the empty man, but it's over pretty quickly. 
Afterward, his doorbell rings and he finds a gift on his doorstep. Then he breaks the cycle, declining to medicate himself and returning his ring to its finger. Newly motivated, he hits the streets, following his young friend to see where the trail leads. They wind all over town, picking up passengers well beyond the load capacity of their vehicle. Luckily, they reach their destination and unload before the springs give out. They enter the back door of a medical facility and James manages to just barely keep up and pursue them through the hospital, where they eventually enter a room and engage in an odd ritual for what looks Looks like Paul, the one who apparently brought the empty man stateside. After the field trip, James does a child abduction, relieved to find that our modern culture is very conducive to such activities. He insists on being provided info, but gets more tangled up mumbo jumbo. There is a prophet, the between one, who needs an empty man to act as a bridge to our world from the nosphere. He brings chaos and will pull back the veil to reveal that nothing is real, which he thinks is pretty cool. When asked directly about Amanda's whereabouts, lest we forget what James has been motivated by this whole time, he just said, that she's on the bridge, which, of course, doesn't exist. James heads back to the Institute now, but it's as if they were expecting him. In the record room, he gets right to the patient's file, somehow, and confirms for us that it is Paul. He's distracted, however, by a file inside the file that's about him, and it contains everything, including photos and items that would seem impossible to acquire. He mulls this over on his way back to the hospital. When he arrives on the floor, he plays like he's a PI and is looking for a missing person. He wants to rule out the patient and starts questioning questioning the night nurse on what she knows about him. She starts out tight-lipped, but then seems to really take pleasure in gossiping about the comatose man, noting how curious it is that someone who's a John Doe and can't speak has so many strange visitors. Why, he even has someone in there right now. James goes in to see if he can pump this person for some more information on Amanda's whereabouts, but it turns out to actually be Amanda, tending to Paul's every need. She refers to him as a carrier of a signal that is contagious. James makes a quick call to Nora to share the good news. I'm but she has no idea who he is. So Amanda explains further that Paul is withering from holding so much power for so long. A replacement is needed, and rather than waiting to chance upon another vessel, they decided to make one this time. Not just in the sense that they capitalized on James' emptiness, but in the sense that he was actually born three days ago, with a lifetime history of pain and fearfulness designed whole cloth by the group. And indeed, the worst moment in his entire life was engineered specifically to help him be a sufficient vessel. This was all accomplished through the art of thought form. Thought plus concentration plus time equals flesh. He then falls back into his memories and becomes witness to his conjuring and the manifestation of the signal, which pursues him in its wedding vestments, hoping to make him its bride and chasing him down a dark hallway. When it eventually catches up with him, it pins him down and ejaculates its entire being down the back of his throat. He flees from this reality while remembering the most painful details of his life, circling back to his house and breaking in to find that it contains nothing, except a hallway that leads to a room where they're keeping Paul. He kills Paul, unsure if he's breaking a cycle or starting a new one and finds himself back in the hospital room. He exits the room where the staff demonstrates their willingness to worship him, bowing down before him and making themselves available to receive his transmission. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Just a quick note that I've added an uncensored review of Under the Skin as a benefit for donation. I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. The Empty Man was a film of epic proportions, and I really enjoyed going along for the ride. I wasn't sure what they were thinking when I saw the runtime after I started watching, but it makes sense. There was a lot to pack in. It's hard for me to analyze films like this when I'm watching for the purpose of breaking down and reassembling the plot, because it becomes very apparent when things are happening for no particular reason or don't receive any real payoff later in the storyline. And this is something we see in this film quite a bit. However, the overall atmosphere and experience of watching was enjoyable. I have to imagine they were trying their best to include as much of the source material as possible while containing the film to a reasonable runtime. Since this inevitably results in trade-offs, I'm genuinely interested to hear what fans of the graphic novel felt about the movie. And if you enjoyed the video, I'd love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.